Hi, everyone. I just want to welcome you to the Producers Guild conversation with George Clooney and Grant Heslop on their film, The Midnight Sky. We'd like to thank our friends at Netflix for making this event possible. <laughs> if you have any questions for our panelists, please submit yours in writing uh, in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator will do her best to present them to our guests. Speaking of moderators, it is my pleasure to introduce ours today. PGA member Jennifer Fox wor worked with George Clooney and Grant Hesloff along with Steven Soderbergh in their production company, Section 8. She produced Siriana, for which George Clooney won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. And she also received an Academy Award nomination as producer of Michael Clayton, starring George Clooney. She has also produced such films as Nightcrawler, Roman Israel Esquire, Velvet Buzzsaw, and The Report. She's currently producing Ridley Scott's The Last Duel, starring Matt Damon, Adam Driver, Ben Affleck, and Jodie Comer to be released in 2021. Welcome panelists. Welcome Jennifer, and please take it away. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you everybody for sticking around. I want to introduce two artists that, of course, to this audience need no introduction, George Clooney and Grant Hasloff. This is- Well, I think, Jen, I think the word artist is a little loose. Okay. <laughs> That's a little strong. A little strong. <laughs> I love this film so much. I love it so much, and I, I feel like I can talk about it for five hours, so I'm gonna try and pace myself, but get right to it. Um, this may be a long-winded way around, but I watched it and I'm simultaneously reading Obama's book, Promised Land. And in his introduction, he talks about the pandemic in a way being the manifestation of our interconnectedness. And he literally says, if we don't reconcile that, we will lose our humanity. Mankind will perish. And I read that chapter and then I turn on your film and I'm like, wow, this is the jumping off point for what you guys have done. And clearly when you started, you didn't know that we were going to be here. And I want to hear all about that. I want to hear how you thought about it, when you began and why you chose it, and then how that evolved over the course of where we are. Well, um, I mean, Grant can speak to this too. We were sent the script by Netflix uh, to, for me to act in and possibly look at directing. And I loved the idea and Grant and I talked about it. And at, originally the, the conversation was about, uh, it's, it was a story about all the mistakes we can make if we don't pay attention. You know, it's, it, whether it's global warming, we, Grant and I are old enough that we grew up with duck and cover drills and things. Well, maybe Grant's actually not old enough. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately I am. And so, you know, we always thought that we'd blow ourselves up at one time or another. And so that was sort of the argument that w we were using at, at, when we started the film. When we finished the film in February and we started post-production from home, uh, suddenly it became clear that it was about what Obama was talking about, which was this, you know, it became a story about our inability to be home, our inability to, to be close to the people we love. And so quite sort of deliberately, we started taking dialogue out and calling up Alexander Desplat and saying, it's now gonna be your on your shoulders to carry some of this narrative through because it really does become about our inability to communicate with one another. And the only way you can sort of do that is to take the sound out and put the music in. You, know? you made a really bold and I think sophisticated choice in not explaining to the audience what happened. <laughs> Talk to us about that. Grant, go. Well, it, it was, that was, a, that was a very uh, deliberate choice. And, and this, you know, it, some, it bothers some people because some people want, they want to know, but for us, you know, when we make movies, we, we want to make movies that we want to watch and that we would watch and that we would like, and we don't want to be spoon fed and, you know, what we can imagine is always so much more powerful than to, to, ex to explain it. So the opening that George shot, when you just see these people, I mean, I feel like you know exactly what's going on for me personally. Um, and we, you know, we, we love to under explain. We did a, when we did Ides of March, 
um, we did a scene where I'm playing the governor running for president. I'm about to fire Philip Seymour Hoffman. And Grant and I wrote a scene where Philip comes in and I go, you know, Phil, can I talk to you for a minute? And he just walks over and he comes in and gets in the car. And we never shot the interior of the car. We shot from the outside and we slowly pushed in and Alexander had music playing. And we just pushed in and pushed in because we were really clear that your imagination as an audience is so much better than any scene we could have written or any scene we could have shot because you're gonna tell yourself the story. And to us, that was so much more exciting. And it informed how we did this in a way because we were like, well, you know, people can decide. I think it's fairly clear, but you can decide what it is. We do have the ability to blow ourselves up in a billion different ways right now. So you know, we designed the, that, that uh, the exterior shot of Earth the first time was based on those satellite shots of California on fire, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah, it also, it helped orient me because I knew that where the story was going, you were telling us and with a very deft hand that this is not the focus. The focus is here. It is on this, this very intimate, lonely thing that's happening. Yeah. And well, that, that's the hope. You know, you, again, look, it goes back to, Go back to Michael Clayton, Jen, and when we were working on that film, you know, we went through a lot of stuff where we just said, take this out, take this out. We don't need to explain everything. Let people, yeah, let people, you know, treat them like grownups and let them come up with their own decisions. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that reminds me that it didn't occur to me until now the open endedness of your ending, very much like the open endedness mm. of Michael Clayton, just that tight shot on your face of, yeah. no. Well, people don't know. Since since this since we're talking to producers, they'll appreciate this. We didn't know if you remember how we were going to end Michael Clayton. Yeah. And we were trying to come up with an ending, and we all had ideas. Yeah. And sort of it came down to this idea. I think it was Soderbergh's idea actually, of basically making it the end of The Graduate, where it's like it's a happy ending, but then what happens after happy? Yeah. And but we hadn't gotten permits to shoot in New York on the street. And so we had all those lights on the around the car, so it's looked it's just standing out like crazy. And we just take off driving down, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York in the middle of the afternoon. And that shot where you'll hear people come up to me now and they'll go, that scene, what you you know, what you were going through at that moment for three and a half minutes, and you were reliving the whole story. And you're all I was trying to do was not laugh <laughs> because every corner we'd stop at a light. And every guy is like, hey, George Clooney, what do you do? Ah. And it was the funniest thing to me because it really does tell you, again, you put the pictures up, you set the story up and you put the pictures out and let them, let the audience sort of decide. And so they got to live it through their eyes as opposed to me having to show anything, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... The, I read a quote from you, you said something like poised between, I have it written here, poised between promise and uncertainty. Well, that's my life, basically. <laughs> that's kind of how we live, right? Grant, that's a that's a Friday night for us. Our motto. Do we have steak or should we have chicken? Let's talk about Augustine, because this character is, um, oh, he's so heartbreaking. Um, I, 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 as a working mother, you have those moments of, am I, you know, never feeling like you're doing anything completely right because you're divided. And now we have the most extreme example of this, of the guy who is working to save humanity, but has neglected his own. And it's heartbreaking and it's so relatable. And talk to me about. Well, again, and then I, I think Grant should talk about it, but, um, you know, for me, the, the idea is always you know, anytime you're playing a character who's, you know, dealing with, and their core issue is regret, as regret's toxic, you know, and I know, Grant and I know people who are old, who have lived with those deep regrets. How did I treat my children? Um, how was I to my wife? How did I take the job I wanted? Did I chase and work at the things I wanted to do? And it's a cancer in them when they get, the older you get, the worse it gets. And so this guy deeply searching for redemption 
was a character that I just thought you can't not do. It was, you know, I have a bit of an advantage because I'm working with a kid. And when you're working with a kid, you know, I, I when I did ER, I worked with kids. I was a pediatrician. I was a womanizer. I was an alcoholic. But at the end, I'd say, don't touch that kid. And everybody's like, well, he likes kids. And so it's a character saver in a way, in a way for, you know, for me to be able to do it. But Grant and I talked about, you know, at first it was like, we thought, well, this is a really good part for me to play. And Yeah, but it wasn't until sort of we got into it that this idea, I, I, at least for me, you know, that I kind of put it all together. You know, here's this guy that I've known for all this time and now he's got two twin kids. <laughs> and so it, it added a level of complexity that, that um, yeah, I don't think he had before, to be quite honest. I mean, it really, it, it just changes the way, it, I mean, you know, as a mother and, and all of you out there who are watching who have kids, you know, it just changes your perspective on everything. And so this really, you know, this is a, a huge film as, as we produce this thing, say, holy shit, this is big. This is the biggest film we've ever done. And yet it's really a tiny story. It's a really intimate story. I think that's what really we both loved about it is because that's the kind of stories we like to tell. Also, you know, my, my kids, we, were, we shot a, a good portion of this in England and the kids came and, you know, when I do the, when I fall through the ice, we shot that in England in a, you know, in one of those, as producers would know, I'm not going to jump in a, you know, in the Arctic waters. So it was in a I to get him to, to save the money, but he wouldn't do it. <laughs> and my kids came to visit while I'm in the tank. And they see me in the tank and we do a take and you know, I come out of the water and he's like, he's lost his, the machine that's going to keep him alive. It tells you from that moment on, he, the clock has started and he's going to die soon. And it's a really terrible moment. I come out of the water and my kids both go, Papa, I want to come swimming. <laughs> and so now anytime I say I'm going to work, they think work is going swimming. Right, right. <laughs> I guess in a way it is. Yeah. Well, you made such a great choice with the characterization of Felicity as, an, as a grown up because she's not someone who has been messed up by not having a father. She turned out okay. Kids are resilient. She's more than okay. She's actually a really substantial human being and has this incredible heart and soul. And for him, though, it's a hole in his heart. And it, the burden of, so in all of those moments of parental guilt, it's like, who's missing out? The parent that's missing out on the experience. Also. And also, Jen, you've been a pregnant working mom. And, you know, when Felicity called and said she was pregnant and we were shooting, there's, you know, and again, here's, here's Grant and I on the phone. Grant, show them what it was like. Oh, that's so exciting. We're so excited for you. <laughs> We were literally like, oh my God. And we tried to shoot around it for a week. And then, you know, we talked in the middle of the night, like one in the morning, Grant and I called each other and it was like, what are we doing? You know, people get pregnant. People are away for two years. It's like going on location, somebody had sex. Um, and so suddenly it became like Fargo in a way where you just go, hey, we're just happy to show women get pregnant. They go to work every day, they do their job. They don't talk about it. It's not an issue. Um, and show her being strong and having her act together. And in a way we just, suddenly it became the driving force on the set. And it became this character that we all had to protect in a way. And it was, you know, you know, it, it, it the, to tell them about the, the call to Netflix, the first call, Grant, remember? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, because didn't matter to us. We were gonna we were gonna use her. I mean, there was just there was no there was no, no getting around it. But there was a lot of talk about how are we gonna uh, how are we gonna do it, you know. And I had to I had to have her because you know when you're shooting weightless stuff, right? You got to be in wires. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that's going on, and we did not feel comfortable putting her on wires. She wanted to be on wires. She's like, I I can do it. I'll do it all. Uh, and so I, I had her doctor come to the set, to the stages and meet with our stunt guys. And they did a whole thing and a whole thing. And the doctor said, no, it's great. She can do it. She can do it. Um, but after we shot, as George said, for a couple of days, you know, she, 
she's pregnant and so trying to act not pregnant when you're pregnant the way you move the way you carry yourself you it was affecting her acting as soon as she could be herself she was she was fantastic so and you and grant and i sort of come out of you know, grant and i first met in acting class in 1982 and uh he literally loaned me 100 bucks for headshots you know we've been partners for a long long time and we did a lot of improv and in, if you're on sitcoms you do a lot of improv and improv is yes and you always you, you never say no right and so the idea was, okay, if she's going to be pregnant, then, and then it's like, well, then let's have the guys trying to name her, to name the baby. And let's have, you know, uh, let's have a scene, you, you know, where she's getting an ultrasound. And I mean, we threw that ultrasound scene together in two days. That's a, a I think it's a, um, a, a, a print, a printer that we yeah, it, was just, it was just some piece of equipment that they, they had on the set like uh we just lit it, it up and we just lit it and we just lit it and made it look like okay this is a, that piece of machinery and knowing that there wasn't going to be much dialogue and knowing that suddenly the idea was going to be as hard as these people are trying to communicate with someone to hear any form of life the only form of life they hear is actually coming from inside you know felicity and that to us suddenly felt beautiful it's perfect and not knowing any of this i watched the film and because i've been a pregnant woman you can <coughs> tell when people are movie pregnant and when they're actually pregnant so from the first frame i was like whoa she's really pregnant how did they time this to be yeah. shooting? Because everything that you have to. So I thought that you guys just like worked it around the fact that you wanted to have an actress who was pregnant. I was like, hmm. that was astounding because that becomes so much of. We're not nearly that good. Of the film. No, we're, we we were we were you know we were peddling on we were you know treading water on that one. But Wait. it ends up. But it does end up being. It matters at the end suddenly. Yeah. Because Originally, the way it is, is they would look at each other and go, I guess it's just you and me now. Right. They weren't a couple at the time in the movie, right. in the script. Right. So when they look at each other and say, well, I guess it's just you and me, that means they're going to have to have sex, you know, and that they have a responsibility. Yeah. Exactly, and they, exactly. It's duty rather than love. And now we have this continuum. And the idea that you're, you're also saving your grandchild. Yes, yeah. and I'm saving my grandchild. Exactly, exactly. So uh, we have to talk about this because the casting of Ethan Peck and the decision not to put, make yourself the younger version of yourself, which we have the technology to do, brilliant because I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't see it coming. It worked so well, talk to us about. Well, first of all, I think Grant will tell you, if I'm casting, you know, Ethan Peck, I'm 5'11", Ethan Peck, six foot three. <laughs> So we, we read a bunch of guys, they were all very good. And I was, I was like, I like this guy. You know, he's good looking and he's six foot three. And you know, I was like, I'm, we're hiring that guy. And he's got the eyebrows. He's, he's got, got good eyebrows. But also the sh something in the shape of the eyes, and, right? Yeah, it was, you, yeah, enough. His, he's Gregory Peck's grandson actually, which was funny. And he's sweet. And we talked to him about how we were gonna be blending my voice and his through Lucas Sound. We were gonna go and I mean, it's so much more complicated than you can imagine. They break it into thousands of molecules to do it. And he was on board, which speaks volumes to the kind of actor he is. But, you know, we had a meeting, Grant, remember when the, the first conversations with Netflix was, do we, uh, because Irishman had just come out and it was like, okay, well, do we do the de-aging? And we'd seen Irishman and I love the movie, but. I remember watching that section of the movie and I couldn't take my eye off of that. Yeah. Not the movie, but the actual technology. And so we thought, uh, I think that that's probably not the best thing for us. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Grant? Was it? Yeah, no, we just, just, we just felt like it, it, it calls attention to something we really didn't want to call attention to. Uh, it's also very uh, expensive and time consuming and, you know, we just figured that these these little pieces, you know, they're very important, but they're not huge. You know, they're not long, long, long sequences. So we figured we could get away with it. And I think it worked really well. Yeah. I want to bring one more little Obama book reference to this because it was so present in my mind. And he talks about how Michelle always teases him that when there's the choice between the hard road and the easy road, he always takes the hard road. And it 
tends to work out mm -hmm. to be the noble and better choice. Mm -hmm. This film, you took the hard road on yeah. so many levels. And I made a little list that I'm just gonna rattle off and then we can talk about any aspect of them. But shooting on a glacier, literally in Iceland, uh, through sub-zero temperatures with a six-year-old on the back of the snowmobile, creating a, a whiteout blizzard in what was one of the scariest scenes I have ever seen. The fear of losing your child is like, uh, um, an underwater sequence, space travel, zero gravity, um, uh, a meteor storm, and then you are acting in, producing, and directing the film. Am I leaving well, anything out? <laughs> this is well, I have an advantage, which is I have a producing partner who's my best friend who I've worked with for 40 years. And so as an actor, you know, Grant's more than just a producer. He's, you know, we go to work every day together. We have lived, I, I've spent much more time with Grant over the years than I have my wife. You know, we, we spend a lot of time together. And so he'll sit behind the monitor while I'm doing a take and I'll look over and go, ah, it's enough. And he'll look, lean over and go, do another take, schmuck. And, you know, so, you know, I have a real honest, smart, good, great filmmaker, great producer, partner. So I'm, I feel like I'm in, you know, I, I was in terms of acting in, in really good hands. And then but the rest. He's he, is being, he is being modest because it was, particularly when we were in Iceland, we were shooting on top of a glacier and it, what, there was a blizzard. And, you know, the way that you have to shoot up there, you know, you use the production services company. <clears throat> They're great. They really know. But like, they literally stake it out. They're like, you can't walk past here. You can't do this because if you do, you might fall through a crevasse and, and you'll be dead. Um, and, you know, George literally, like, even for the look of, of his beard, he would spray his face with water from an Evian bottle, spray it, spray it, spray it, then get on a snowmobile and ride around in sub zero weather so that he'd get those fucking icicles on his face. I mean, it was just, it was brutal. It was brutal, but it was so much fun. And, I don't know. It feels like every time we you do it, it feels like an adventure. I mean, you would know, Jen, you've been to some amazing and crazy places, Morocco and all over the place to shoot. And it's, it's just, it's, it's what makes what we do so much fun and so challenging and so rewarding. And, uh, uh, you know, the bigger the challenge for, for me, the better. And your grant had to, Early on, you know, there was other things that happened that people don't really know much about. Like, I ended up having this uh, this attack, this pancreatic, you know, uh, pancreatitis attack. Like five days before we shot, I'm in Reading Hospital for two nights on morphine. Like I was in, and we were already a crew was there. We were getting ready to shoot on on a glacier and Grant had to shoot the first two days, was it? Yeah. Um, he Netflix just had to know this by the way. So yeah. uh, anyway, <laughs> it all worked out. But we had to, he had to, he had to shoot the first two days wow. um, of, of just, there was no scenes. It was just shooting, you know, footage for all the stuff that we needed, including all the background stuff for our, you know, for our walls that were all LED screens. And you know, so he was doing all the, the, the crappy hard work while I was sort of getting strong enough to get on a plane and come to Iceland and shoot. And so I was I had an advantage because we only worked for like five hours a day because that's all the sunlight we had. And oh, yeah. so I got to, I would go home and I'd lay in bed for 18 hours and then get up and go to work. So it was physically brutal, like brutal. Hard. But great, but great for the character. Yeah, it's great for the kid, but it's hard because you're also directing. Yeah, it was. So, you know, it's good to sap your energy for the part, but it was hard for the. And we we would just go back to the room and just laugh, going, you know, this is just so. You know how you do, Jen. You've been here. I remember in Syriana, we had so many moments where we were like, "What the fuck are we doing?" You know, where, <laughs> you know, they, 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 you know, you wouldn't understand the culture of, you know, the different sects. In, in Morocco or in Dubai and all the things that were going on. And and we'd, we'd sit there and go, what the fuck are we doing? Why did we say yes to this? And then, you know, yeah. that, that's fun of it. Well, 
no one has more fun on films than the two of you. Mm -hmm. Having worked on a lot with you and without you, it is always fun, but it had to wear on you. And you put together this family, I know from experience, of your, your department heads that you go back to time and time again, and they're your trusted people. And talk to us a little bit about I'm, all of them. You talked a bit about Alexander Despot is absolutely brilliant. Jim Bissell, your brilliant production designer. Martin, your cinematographer. It's just well, dream team. Well, you found, I didn't you find Alexander Despot on yeah. Syria? So he had just done Birth and we were blown away. So yes. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. I remember when we there was a screen we there, a screening of Syrian in LA we were we were all going to and I was in the lobby and I see this guy who's got like huge scarf around him and his whole thing I'm like who the fuck is that guy and he turned out to be you know one of the one of our composer. best composers uh, in the world and we've done so many films with him now yeah and, I mean he's a genius I mean we went to you know, the end of the movie, the way we had it, I cut it to uh, Claire de Lune, to Debussy, which is a French composer. And uh, and it was cut to that. And then we pulled that out and said, OK, go, do Debussy. And he's right. like, you want me to do Debussy? <laughs> we're like, yeah, do it. And he did this beautiful, beautiful score that's just, I mean, it's, and, and there's more music in this film than he's ever written, you know, so. I mean, he just did an amazing job. Um, Martin, we d started with the American working on, and then and did uh, uh, and then Catch Twenty Two with him. And I I think he's the great unsung DP in the business. He's mm -hmm. fast. He does exactly what you want, and then he comes in with his ideas of like using these untuned lenses that were just amazing. Um, the, the rest of the gang, Jenny Egan, the yeah, our wardrobe, you know, she, you know and you, you, you know this and all any, everybody out there knows this, you know, when you find people that are great and that you get along with and that elevate you uh, as a producer, director, whatever it is, you know, it really is just about, you know, making sure they're available when you need them. That's always, that just seems to be the hardest part, particularly lately, because everybody's, thank God, right now people seem to be busy. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the restrictions that you had of doing post during the pandemic and how that worked. Well, we, I mean, look, we, we, we weren't going anywhere. George and I weren't going anywhere or doing anything. So we, uh, we just had a, you know, we did everything just like we're doing this. You know, we, Steve Marioni, the editor, uh, George could work with him in real time. Um, and then, he would get on and show us stuff. Uh, we had visual effects meeting once a week. We had a, you know, visual effects were really the, the hardest thing in this film. Also because just to get them done in time, because uh, when you're working with Netflix, you know, they, they need a lot of time for delivery because they, they release in so many different countries at once. They have a lot, a lot to do on top. And so every Friday we would have a visual effects uh, showing on Zoom. And it, so it was pretty normal except that we never were in a room. The, the hardest part was the score. George, tell him, tell him kind of what we had to go well, through. Yeah, the Alexander, had just, he couldn't get into England. So he's conducting from Paris. It's a 150 piece orchestra playing in, at Abbey Road in London. And we were at four in the morning in LA sitting in screen rooms yeah. watching a big screen with a Zoom going. And they, they could, could only, about 15 musicians at a time. Yeah. So they had the layer, you know, so we had all these stems together that we'd have to eventually put them together to make sure we had a score. Right. Um, I mean, all of it, look, all these things were, you know, they were, they were all tricky because we hadn't done it this way before. Yeah. We right. finally screened it on a big screen. We rented out the village in, uh, in Westwood and we went in and to see it on a big screen because we wanted to know what we'd missed because, you know, we found a little shot of a, a camera a dolly track in the shot that we had to paint out and, you know, stuff that you can't see when you're looking on your computer or on your home screen. Yeah. Sadly for us, this is the first movie we've ever made that, that we've never seen it with an audience. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. It's heartbreaking because yeah. it's such a widescreen experience. I know. Film, but the time will come and we're all going to get to see it someday. Post-pandemic, we're going to do a huge 
find the biggest theater we can find and yes. screen it just just to see it with a live audience. I mean, that's part of the fun. Yeah, yeah. Strange times we're in. Yeah. We have a couple of questions from the audience that I want to ask, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so here I'm reading. I'm reading the uh, Q and A, and I see one question that says, "George, are you really this sexy in person?" <laughs> Uh, that's, that's oh that was from Grant sorry. <laughs> well, I was trying to write a question on here that you. Would I was too. I couldn't figure out how to do it. I got under the Q and A and I was gonna try to sneak one in and then you know. Mine was gonna be why is George uh, why is Grant seem so much more handsome than George on Zoom but I couldn't get it on there. Right so Melissa Friedman is asking how is the pandemic affecting what you're gonna do for your next project. Hmm. A lot. Well. And it, I mean, it's it's affected in a lot in a lot of ways. One is we hope we can do it. We're, you know, we're scheduled to start shooting something uh, February twenty second. So, and we're we're in full prep right now. Um, shooting uh, in LA? No, shooting back east. Um, it's also you know it's killed the budget. It's added you know twenty percent to the budget, and on a, on a film that's not a huge budget, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. It doesn't get up on the screen, so that's that's tricky. And um, you know, listen, Tom Cruise wasn't wrong. I mean, uh, he wasn't wrong in in the message. That's for sure. It's really it's a tough time, and everybody everybody's really got to step up. So we're hopeful, though. We're hopeful we'll get to make it. We we chose a a, a film. We were going to do a much bigger film. We had planned that before the pandemic, but we we ended up going with a much more contained piece. So we'll see how see how it works. What about you? You're, you're shooting too, right? Jen? No, I'm not shooting anything right now. Just in post on the last duel. So Oh, but didn't didn't they go back? Didn't you guys go back to like we Ireland? We did. Yeah. So we're we're now wrapped. And it was during that window of the summer where things before the summer, the spring, right. things yeah. were at their best. Yeah. And, and Ireland particularly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we were very, very lucky. We did shut down. We were shooting in France. And um, I came home just before the shutdown because my plan was to pick up my kids for their spring break and then the whole family was gonna come for Ireland. And it was just when we were doing our company move between France and Ireland that the shutdown happened. Mm -hmm. And so then it became the mad dash to get everybody home. Yeah. And find flights and find, but luckily it all worked out. Matt was like, Ireland is awesome. I'm just staying here. And he hunkered down and had the best time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it all worked out. We were very, very lucky. Yeah. But you know, when, when you're working with an 83 year old director, you know, just everything was as careful as could be. We had our own testing machine and um, ability to do it ourselves and just, we stayed on top of it and it worked out very, very well. But we were lucky and we were also lucky we had a studio that poured a lot of money into it to allow us to finish it. Right, yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Let me see if I'll have one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, uh, By the way, Jen, did you like the blood scene? Oh God. That was yeah. crazy. Uh, Ah, that was that was our biggest. That was our because that's when we're you know we I've described to the effects guys and told them that I want it to be a ballet of blood and I've told Alexander to write a piece of music for that. Yeah. Well, we didn't get that those shots finished until mid November, Grant. Yeah. So I mean, we, it was we didn't get them. We didn't get them until uh, you know, I mean. We didn't deliver we, until we just put those shots in, and then we delivered. I mean, it was, they were literally the last thing. Right. Uh, so that was one of the like, That sequence on. is incredible. There are just so many incredible sequences in this. Um, you guys have to be really proud. Congratulations. Thank fun. you. Well, I think we should wrap it up now. Um, that means that the Q and A questions are really snarky. Is that what it is? <laughs> uh, well, how has it been partnered with Netflix? How about that? We loved it. They're oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, yeah. here's the thing. First of all, it's Scott Stuber who used to run Universal. So it's really like working in the studio system. Didn't you work with Scott? 
I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I worked with Scott uh, in just before I started with Section yeah. 8. I was an executive at Universal with him. We go way back. Yeah. He was great. And I did a film with him. I couldn't be a better partner. Um, and that's how we felt. We felt like we were working with filmmakers. And they're great. And, and also, there's the other thing that, you know, that, that everybody's panicked right now because no one's taking care of the theater owners. And, you know, what's going to happen to the theaters? They should be subsidized. We subsidize oil companies. You know, they should be helped out. We will be back in cinemas. These two things are not, you know, mutually exclusive. And for us, when I was growing up, man, there was, when you did a television series in 1984, when I was doing a TV series, on Monday mornings, Grant, you remember this? You'd go to the back of the newspaper and you look up the ratings to see if you were going to stay on the air. There were 65 shows, 64, I think. Most, like 50 of them were acting jobs. Some of them were like news shows. And that was it, 64, television, you know, 64 TV shows and maybe 50 films. And that was it for an actor for work. Now there is thousands and thousands of opportunities to Not work. just actors, directors, producers, of course. Crap, everybody. So, yes. This is the golden age for all of us for work. Um, and and it and I don't think for a minute that you know people worry about this. They worried about it when TV and VHS and DVDs. The truth of the matter is people still want to go out. You know, and you got to, and, and they want a collective experience. We do. I want to be in a movie theater with a comedy. Yeah. You yeah. know, what I miss. And, and so. I think that when we do go back, we're going to so appreciate having lost that. We're going to want to do it much more than we had been. And we're, we're you know, we, we maybe took it for granted. No and so I don't think that these guys are mutually exclusive. I think they just add to the ability. Look, it democratizes storytelling, uh, yeah. Netflix does, because they're saying, okay, well, let's see, they're, they're, here's a 22-year-old filmmaker who has an idea and wants to tell a story, wouldn't necessarily have gotten a shot in the old systems that we grew up in, and now they're all getting shots, and it, and we're getting to see, I mean, how, like, remember how addicted we were, Grant, to uh, Money Heist, the, the Spanish TV series? Who would have, we would never have been able to see it. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, originally this was going to be in 600 theaters. Yeah, uh, domestically, that was part of the deal that we made with them. Right, uh, obviously that couldn't happen. So, you know, look, they're they're moving in that direction too. So, I'm I'm very optimistic about all that. I mean, once we get through this, yeah, you know, hopefully the next time we meet with the PGA, we can all be in a room together. Yeah, because uh, that's certainly a that's certainly a, a, a fun way to do it. You could all be here with me in my fireplace. Yes. Doesn't this look domestic here? It looks very British. Well, what you can't see is the sweat pouring down my back right now because I thought it looked <laughs> nice, but I'm sweating. We didn't talk about where you are. Where are you? I'm in London. Uh, I landed here five, six days ago. We were going to do a premiere, a drive-in premiere. It was all going to be fun. It was all set up. And when we landed, they go, Oh, right, you've moved to tier three. I'm like, oh, what's that mean? They go, go to your house and don't come out for two weeks. And I was like, okay. So the, the now the, the, the drive-in premiere is canceled and we go to the house and it's fine. And then yesterday, Boris came out and said, now we're tier four. And so now the question will be whether or not I'm even allowed to come back to LA where we're gonna, supposed to go scout locations and do all that stuff. So listen, the good news is this, there is a vaccine, it's in the future, we see it, there's light at the end of this tunnel. We're all gonna get through this as a, as a group together. And, um, and you know, by, the, by the middle of this summer, um, a good portion of this is gonna be in our rear view mirror. And you know, we'll have lost a lot of people along the way and we need to um, pay attention or we're gonna lose a lot more, but we're, there is an end in sight and we just have to be diligent until then. Well, thank you again, and congratulations on your gorgeous film. Thank you. I can't thank wait you to see you on the screen. And it was good to see you and have fun. And say happy. Yeah, and happy holidays to both of yeah. you. Yeah, you too. Happy holidays to everybody. Yeah. If, if there is anybody watching, there's, I see there's 11 people, Grant. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bye. Thank you. See ya.